Everyone, um, welcome to CSIS. My name is Rebecca Hurstman. I am the director on the, of the project on nuclear issues here and a senior advisor in the International Security Program and I'm pleased to welcome you. You are here attending the event on restoring restraint, enforcing accountability for users of chemical weapons. So if that wasn't the meeting you thought you were attending, this is your moment to step out. Um, very, very pleased that you're all here. We welcome you and all those who are, are viewing this event online. Um, and thank you for paying attention to this very important issue. I do have a couple of announcements as we get started. My first responsibility is to make the requisite safety announcement. Uh, we do here at CSIS take safety very uh, seriously. We take every precaution while we feel extremely safe in our beautiful building. If for any reason you hear an alarm or the loudspeaker providing instructions, please follow those instructions exactly. I am your designated safety officer. We would exit the building straight through the doors, down the stairs, out the front, and around the corner to the left. Uh, if for any reason our exit out the front were to be blocked, we would proceed out the back door and through the rear exit. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to move on to the substance. Now a few things for those of you who are on social media. Uh, our meeting is on the record. Uh, it is being live streamed. It will be recorded as part of our, one of our YouTube recordings um, and available on the CSIS website. We are live tweeting for, for the event from our CSIS project on nuclear issues, Pony account, using the hashtag CSIS live. Um, a moment of thank yous and appreciations are due as well. This event, as well as the entire report and activity, uh, is part of a PASC study that was sponsored by the U.S. Air Force Academy and uh, that we are now bringing to a close with this, the launch of this report. Our study team would like to thank everyone who graciously offered feedback and time uh, to support this, uh, this project uh, at roundtables in Washington and D.C. and New York City. We're grateful for the time and participation from staff and country representatives at the OPCW. Very grateful to our speakers who are here today, to each of you in the audience who decided this issue was important enough to give it your attention. I do want to mention a special thank you to Will Patinos, who is in the office, who recently departed the staff, but you'll see on the byline was absolutely critical in pulling the event and the report together. So thank you very, very much to Will as well. So in particular, I'm really grateful and pleased to announce everyone who's uh, come to support this effort and speak out on this critical issue. This, um, the use of chemical weapons is a problem that needs far more attention. The repeated use of chemical weapons and the failure of the international community to hold perpetrators of these crimes to account is worthy of our attention, our effort, our research, and our analysis. We here at CSIS began this project over a year ago with the mindset that we can and must do more to hold the users of these weapons to account, to deter the further use of these weapons, to reinforce the norms and taboos against these weapons, and to deny their benefits to state or non-state actors that may seek to gain through their use. Our goal was to demonstrate that more effective action is both possible and worth the effort. Over the last year, this imperative has grown. Chemical weapons use has continued and spread, and yet the international community has been stymied in its attempt to respond. Last January, we saw the establishment of the International Partnership Against Impunity for Chemical Weapons, a multilateral effort to stand for the victims of these crimes and against those who use or enable the use of chemical weapons. Next week, the OPCW will convene the fourth ever special meeting of states parties to address these concerns and seek to establish a lasting and just accountability process. So we're very thankful to our esteemed speakers that they've taken the time to come and speak out on this important topic. Today we'll be hearing from uh, Ahmed Zumchu, who is the Director General of the OPCW. We'll hear from the Assistant Secretary of State, Yelene Poblet, Samantha Job from the UK Embassy, and Nicola Roche from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in France. I'll introduce their bios in more detail shortly, but thank you to all of you for taking time out of your busy day and schedules to pay attention to this effort. Um, you have flyers in your seats to talk about the report and offer a summary. We have the online links to the report here as well. 
Um, but what I thought I would do, if you would indulge me for about three minutes, is share with you a short um, video uh, that we think sums up some of why this is important, what we think we need to do about it, and hopefully we'll encourage you and others to continue to work uh, and research in this area. So if we could um, tee up the video, and then after that, I will introduce our first speaker of the day. Sarin, mustard, chlorine, VX and Novichok. The use of these agents represents the most extensive and diverse set of chemical weapons used since World War I. Since 2012, more than 200 instances were reported in the Syrian conflict alone. But the problem extends beyond Syria. Dozens of instances have been reported on the battlefield in Iraq. Chemical weapons were used as an assassination tool at an airport in Malaysia. And the attack in the UK against a former Russian spy and his daughter indicates this problem isn't contained to a single region. The system of taboos, norms, disincentives, and deterrence that encouraged restraint over the past century is under threat. The removal of declared chemical weapons and subsequent airstrikes in Syria made headlines, but most cases of chemical weapons use have received little or no attention. International responses have been stymied at the UN Security Council and OPCW. The accountability system is broken. But not all hope is lost. These cases provide lessons and opportunities to rebuild a system of restraint. We can rebuild a strong global non-proliferation regime supported by accountability and enforcement. The international community has several tools available to investigate and punish chemical weapons use. Investigations ensure that claims of chemical weapons use are verified and documented. Perpetrators must be held accountable. That the international community will not stand by and tolerate the use of chemical weapons. The OPCW has successfully supported investigations in partnership with domestic law enforcement in Malaysia, Iraq and the United Kingdom. Evidence from investigations must be compiled to call out perpetrators publicly. The OPCW partnered with local or national law enforcement organizations. Non-governmental organizations could also fill this role, as Human Rights Watch did in Syria. After actors are identified, appropriate punishments should follow. Consequences should impact something of value to the violator. For example, pressure on a military facility, an economic center, or individuals responsible for the attack should rely on international consensus, but can be unilateral when necessary. Once appropriate consequences are identified, they must be delivered quickly and consistently. Whether through trial, diplomatic statements, sanctions, or military force, these efforts must be enforced consistently and internationally. Otherwise, perpetrators will act with impunity, further eroding the incentive to adhere to a system of restraint. Hold this regime accountable for the crimes that it's committed, and uh, the United States will not be silent. Launched in 2018, the French-led International Partnership Against Impunity for the Use of Chemical Weapons was the first effort outside of formally established organizations to hold perpetrators accountable for chemical weapons use and to create cooperative approaches to face future cases. We must build on the French-led model and ensure that the partnership and similar initiatives are implemented consistently. A system based on accountability and enforcement is necessary to restrain future chemical weapons use and provide justice for victims of these heinous crimes. So a quick sort of a three-minute summary, um, but I think it lays out some of the issues and some of the pathways forward, and hopefully you'll have a chance to look at the report to see where else we think we can make some, uh, some progress. But for now, I am very honored to introduce our first speaker, and uh, uh, Ahmed Azumchu, the Director General of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, is well known to many in this room, certainly to those of us who've worked on this issue. He was appointed Director General of the OPCW in December of 2009 by the Conference of States Parties in its 14th session and began his term of office in July of 2010. 
He was responsible for the, a second term, or a re, excuse me, reappointed for a second term by the CSP at its 18th session in December of 2013. Who back in 2009 would have known that you would have been present at the OPCW for such a remarkable time of so much change, of so much activity, of so much important pressure on the organization, and a time of such uh, tremendous responsibility. Um, as you come sort of to the end of, of that time, we're really looking forward to hearing your views on how that experience has been, where the organization should go, and how um, we should seek to further address these issues. Uh, he's part, had a long-standing diplomatic career, including representing Turkey at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, at the CD, and at other international organizations. And on behalf of the OPCW, Director Azumchu uh, received the 2013 Nobel Peace Prize. So with that, let me please invite you to the podium and join me in welcoming applause. Take a moment to recognize our moderator, Ms. Rebecca Hirschman, who combines academic achievement with dedicated public service. She is no stranger to the OPCW. As Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, she played a key role in coordinating and ensuring vital U.S. support for the removal and destruction of serious chemical weapons. The last time I spoke at the CSIS, uh, five years ago, it was before the Syria mission. Since then, the OPCW has faced several challenges. I am particularly pleased to address you today during my last visit to the United States in my current capacity. When we raise concerns about accountability, it's extremely important to clearly identify the pertinent legal framework under which such reckoning can take place, its strengths, its possible weaknesses, and the remedies to restore its effectiveness. As Director General of the OPCW, the Chemical Weapons Convention is central to my frame of reference. It is a treaty, the framework that the OPCW was charged to uphold to promote its universalization and to ensure its full and effective implementation globally. It's generally acknowledged that the CWC regime has performed better than expected. These assessments take into account the steady implementation of the convention over two decades the progress in realizing key priorities and its resilience and adaptability in responding to challenges. Let me elaborate a bit on each of these aspects. The comprehensive prohibition established in the Chemical Weapons Convention tolerates no exception, either in terms of possession or use of chemical weapons. We also know that this is not merely a declaratory treaty. Membership of the Convention means that all states parties need to be proactive in implementation through declarations, allowing inspections, and meaningful national implementation measures. Compliance with legal obligations is not an idle concept, but requires constant and active oversight. This is the responsibility of the policy-making organs of the OPCW, namely the Executive Council and the Conference of States Parties. In terms of key indicators of success, let us take the priority goal of worldwide elimination of chemical weapons stockpiles. Today, 96% of all declared chemical weapons have been destroyed. Once the remaining 4% stored in Colorado and Kentucky are eliminated by 2023, the world will mark an historic development, the first occasion when an entire category of weapons of mass destruction will have been eliminated under independent international verification. In the context of peace and security, there cannot be a better example of what, of what can be accomplished multilaterally. As a major possessor state, the United States has remained committed to its obligations to destroy its chemical weapons. Despite the challenges encountered in the process on account of domestic, legal, environmental, and technical issues, it has stayed the course. The Russian Federation has similarly adhered to its commitments and has already concluded the destruction of the declared stockpile of chemical weapons. 
it's very likely that resi resi residual problems will, will remain. We must thus continue to address these by seeking universal adherence to the Convention. Who knows, for example, what additional benefits the recent historic summit between the United States and the DPRK might yield. The Cold War and the non-possession of large stocks of chemical weapons by the two protagonists no doubt shaped the structure and content of the Convention. However, the Convention led to the declaration of a number of other chemical weapons uh, programs which were also eliminated under the OPSW verification. This clearly makes the Convention a legal framework of global reach and vital to international security and non-proliferation objectives. Verification is and will remain the bedrock of the Chemical Weapons Convention. This includes industry verification, which will continue unabated. Initially built from scratch, the verification regime is now firmly established and accepted. It can also be adapted to respond to future requirements. Add to this the rapid expansion of, in the membership. Today, the Convention is accepted by 193 countries of the world. This means that the use of chemical weapons has been stigmatized universally. Destruction of declared chemical weapons is the most visible and quantifiable achievement of the Chemical Weapons Convention regime. A well-entrenched system of verification promotes confidence in compliance with key treaty provisions on non-production and non-diversion. I consider it important to also spend a few moments explaining how the OPSW's success in this area has led to a major rethink about its future. When I took over as Director General in 2010, it became evident to me that having eliminated the bulk of declared chemical weapons, the organization needed to adapt to the post-destruction phase. As a leading priority, verification of destruction was taking up most of our organizational resources. With fewer weapons remaining to be destroyed, a significant part of our operational capacity faced redundancy with temptations to downsize running high. Many had felt, erroneously in my view, that the complete elimination of declared chemical weapons would be a situation of mission accomplished with not much left for the OPSW to do thereafter. Should such thinking have become mainstream, that would have sounded like a death knell for the organization. However, an advisory board that I called upon recommended in 2011 that the OPSW be maintained as a global repository of knowledge and expertise in the field of chemical weapons. For this, real for this reallocation of resources and reordering of priorities had become necessary. What needed to be asserted and reaffirmed was the real nature and abiding goals of the Convention. The Convention is not meant to only eliminate chemical weapons, in a particular time frame, but also to protect and to strengthen the norms against them in perpetuity. This means that our work is never done and that we need to continue to keep the Convention and the OPSW fully capable and active. This is to ensure that chemical weapons will never re-emerge and that we are always prepared to meet unexpected challenges. It was also important not to lose sight of the fact that there are some significant absentees in the list of membership. Therefore, we could not do away with the capacity to carry out verification of destruction in case one or more countries decided to join as possessor states. In fact, this is exactly what happened. At a time when such existential questions about the OPSW's future were being raised, Syria joined the Convention in 2013 and declared an extensive and sophisticated chemical weapons program. This was an unprecedented mission. The credit for the success of the demilitarization operation in Syria is evenly shared between those directly connected to the work and over 30 states parties who came forward with financial and material support as well as the United Nations. This work was carried out under extremely compressed timelines. It was followed by the work of the fact-finding mission and that of the declaration assessment team. These are all assignments that prove the resilience of the Convention in addressing real-life problems. By maintaining such capacity, dynamism, and adaptability, the OPSW will be able to continue to serve contemporary security interests and to meet future challenges. Today, we are acutely aware of the persistence of old threats and the emergence of new ones. 
Our discussions on the future relevance of the Convention, together with our mission in Syria, have cl clarified many of the doubts and removed the skepticism about the continued relevance of the organization. We have reinvigorated our relationship with the global chemical industry, elevated discussions on science and technology, which is evident in the work of the Scientific Advisory Board. This includes enhancing our ability in the area of forensics while reviewing methods and technologies used in our investigative assignments. This will better prepare, prepare the organization for contingency operations, especially those relevant to investigations of alleged use of chemical weapons. Our outreach efforts have extended to crucial audiences as we seek to deepen our relationship with the key partners in science, academia, industry, and non-governmental organizations. An advisory board on education and outreach established in 2016 remains active in this field. Terrorism has formally acquired a priority for the organization to address. The open-ended working group on terrorism provides a forum to discuss prevention, response, and legal accountability aspects of the issue. This subject is now a standing item on the agenda of the Executive Council, which adopted a, a decision on the matter uh, last October. The OPSW recently hosted the first international conference on countering chemical terrorism, which brought together representatives of governments, international organizations, and civil society. I have also sought through a new initiative to upgrade the OPSW Chemical Laboratory to a center for chemistry and technology. There is need to augment the organization's technical and scientific capacity to fully address the threat of chemical weapons. Focus on training and research will be important undertakings for the center together with capacity building programs. A new mechanism has been established for providing a quick response in the case of a chemical weapons attack where a state party might be unable to cope with the situation on its own. This is known as the Rapid Response and Assistance Mission, or RAM in short. The organization demonstrated itself capable of adapting to the new security environment. In order to sustain such effectiveness, the international community must come together on a, on a few fundamental imperatives. Recent events underscored the need for an agreement to respond fully when instances of use of chemical weapons are uncovered. This is the core premise of our discussion today on which I will make a few points for your consideration. We are indeed at a crossroads. There have been a number of confirmations of the use of chemical weapons. Some of these have been looked into further and attribution established. The attribution mechanism, however, left following disagreements in the Security Council. When there, there exist fully functional international organizations with clearly defined mandates relevant to peace and security, it's natural to wonder where and why action is lacking in bringing to book those who choose to use chemical weapons. Chemical weapons used in Syria, incidents at Kuala Lumpur, airport and recently in Salisbury represent a rude awakening to the reality of chemical weapons in our contemporary world. Against the widespread and strong sentiment of protecting the norm and upholding the rules of the convention, we unfortunately find a political reality that prevents action beyond a certain point. Such is the dilemma we currently face. We must thus try to resolve this as quickly as possible to restore faith in the effectiveness of the multilateral system on which international peace and security are entirely dependent. It's important here to appreciate the strengths of the existing international mechanisms, but also to be aware of the limitations under which these function. As in any other international organization, responsibilities have been divided between the executive arm of the OPSW, the technical secretary that which I had, and the policy-making organs, the Executive Council, and the Conference of State Parties. Oversight functions, policy decisions, and such sensitive matters as judgments about compliance all belong to the policy organs. In implementing their will, the Secretary draws upon its expertise and remains committed to objectivity and impartiality. Success is assured when these two organs work in tandem and each performs within the authority assigned to it. In this manner, they work productively with results often exceeding expectations. Take, for example, the mission to eliminate CS chemical weapons program. It became possible once the United States and Russia were able to forge an understanding and agreement to resolve the international crisis created 
by the chemical weapons attacks in Ghouta in suburban Damascus in August 2013. Also, in implementing the complex decisions that guided our work in Syria, continuing understanding and cooperation between Russia and the United States remained critical. A shared responsibility was created between the UN and OPSW for the implementation of the removal and destruction of Syria's chemical weapons capabilities. It's important to note that from the beginning, it was understood that any question of compliance would have to be dealt with by the United Nations Security Council and not the OPSW. There seems to have been general optimism that the Security Council would continue to enjoy consensus and act accordingly. Subsequently, when the reports of the fact-finding mission confirmed the use of chemical weapons in Syria, it was again, again assumed that any further action would be the responsibility of the UN Security Council. The creation of the Joint Investigative Mechanism in August 2015 was an extension of this understanding, that is to say that the responsibility of holding those accountable resided with the UN Security Council, which was expected to act on the reports of the FFM and those of the GYM. The gym went on to identify the perpetrators in the context of a number of attacks. However, the Security Council was unable to act further, and the mandate of the gym lapsed. Currently, while the OPSW fact-finding mission is looking into continuing reports of use of chemical weapons, there is no follow-up mechanism that would identify the perpetrators. This is a major gap and prevents necessary remedial action action that would serve to restore confidence in compliance with the prohibitions of the Convention. The implications of the current deadlock are disturbing. OPSW undertook investigations into allegations of use in circumstances made most difficult to, due to the ongoing civil war in Syria. Security conditions made on-site activities highly risky and therefore nearly impossible, especially after an armed attack on the very first attempt made by the FFM to visit sites of interest. Yet in the collection, analysis, and reporting of evidence, we have never compromised on procedures and methods that are grounded in the Convention and its science, conforming with internationally accepted standards. It's only after following the most rigorous procedures that the FFM has documented numerous incidents confirming the use of chemical weapons. It has investigated over 80 allegations and established the use or likely use of toxic chemicals as weapons in 16 incidents. In parallel with the activities of the FFM, the OPSW has also been working to clarify outstanding issues concerning the Syrian Arab Republic's initial declaration of its chemical weapons program. The OPSW, through its declaration assessment team, or DAT, has engaged with the Syrian authorities in order to resolve the gaps, inconsistencies, and ambiguities in its declaration. The organization has conducted 19 visits to Syria and held numerous consultations with Syrian officials, both in The Hague and Damascus. Provisions by Syria of technically and scientifically plausible explanation to a number of questions remains the key to bringing this matter to a satisfactory conclusion. The information made available as so far has not been sufficient for the Secretariat to confirm that the Syrian Arab Republic has submitted a declaration that can be considered accurate and complete. This brings me to the concluding part of my remarks. Any regime requires for its success a good faith effort at full and effective implementation. In the case of the Chemical Weapons Convention, this entails complete and accurate declarations transparency, national legislation, international inspections, and verification. It's equally important for the various organs of the organization to function to their fullest. The Secretary must be allowed the space in which it can carry out its responsibilities without the fear of political <coughs> backlash. In turn, the policymaking organs must ensure their full support for those who take serious risks in carrying out their responsibilities to conduct investigations on behalf of the state's parties. Without such a well-oiled machinery, our advance towards a rule-based international order is likely to suffer. The Convention creates an elaborate legal framework that also provides remedies in cases where compliance becomes an issue. However, in cases of serious breaches, the authority for remedial action ultimately belongs to the U.S. Security Council. 
chemical weapons use, whether it occurs in Syria, Iraq, Colombo, or Salisbury, is a serious offense requiring resolute action. If there is no accountability, the potential reemergence and acceptance of chemicals as weapons of war and terror will not be deterred. A culture of impunity cannot be allowed to develop around the use of chemical weapons. Later this month, a special session, actually next week, of the Conference of States Parties will be held to consider a response to the situation that we confront. The conference is expected to review the role the OPSW could play in terms of attribution. Until now, the organization has confined itself to simply establishing the factual part of what, is, uh, what, it, is, what it investigated. Should the conference decide on any new measures, I am confident that the Secretariat will once again prove equal to the task. There would be no legal impediments <coughs> to give a mandate of at, for, attribution, uh, for attribution work to the Secretariat. My concern, however, is the present lack of unity among states parties. It's now time for the decision makers, the governments, to act with unity and to fulfill their responsibilities. This, in my view, is the key challenge today. 20 plus years of the operation of the convention indicate a trajectory of, side, of, trajectory of progress and consolidation that is unprecedented. This work represents the singular international organized effort of global reach for the permanent abolition of an entire class of weapons of mass destruction. The culture of the OPCW has always been marked with a split that allowed accommodation of a variety of views while remaining focused on clearly defined goals. A number of difficult issues have in the past been handled within the framework of the convention and in the best traditions of multilateralism by giving up on maximalist positions through constructive debate and discussion and by never giving up on the search for compromise. Challenges can be turned into opportunities if we all decide to respect our collective interests instead of pressing parochial agendas. Civil society must continue to raise its voice in favor of what is sensible and just. This is crucial. At the same time, and with respect to the general state of health of the OPSW, I can say without fear of contradiction that we have before us the outlines of a well thought out roadmap. It has been extensively debated. When implemented, it will indeed enable the international community to continue to reap the security and other benefits of the Convention well into the future. Restoring political cooperation, ensuring the provisions of the necessary financial resources for the organization will enable a strong OPCW to contribute to international peace and security. U.S. support for the OPCW has remained critical over the years. Apart from its assessed annual contribution, which in terms of the quantum represents the largest share in the OPCW regular budget, the U.S. has funded numerous OPCW programs through generous voluntary contributions. I am confident that on its part, the United States will continue with this, this tradition of strong support for the organization. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions, if you're, if you're willing. Um, so we can uh, open the floor. And I think we have microphones in the back, if anyone would like to raise a question. Alicia, please state your name and affiliation. Hi, uh, I'm Alicia Sanders-Zachary with the Arms Control Association. Um, and my question centers around the special session coming up next week. Um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of expectation about the creation of an attribution mechanism um, through this special session. And I was wondering if you could talk about the different options to create such a, an attribution mechanism and if this session does not succeed um, in creating an attribution mechanism, what role you see for yourself or for your successor um, who takes office in July to um, take on this role? I think uh, I, I made very clear in my public statements that uh, the current situation uh, was not uh, sustainable. And um, as I said in my statement, there is a major gap. Uh, and uh, everyone agrees um, uh, that uh, there is a need for accountability uh, in regard to the use of chemical weapons. And they acknowledge that there is a gap. 
and this must be addressed. So if the Conference of State Parties next week can adopt a decision uh, to give a mandate to the Secretary to develop some arrangements uh, for attribution work, and this work can be done by the OPSW uh, in technical terms, but uh, they would need, of course, a, a mandate for it. Um, if it doesn't happen, I, I, I don't know, but uh, again, I think uh, the international community should continue uh, to work uh, toward, towards that goal. Uh, there are some other mechanisms uh, which are in place by the UN General Assembly, Triple IM. Uh, there is the <coughs> Partnership Against Impunity, which was initiated by the uh, French government. Uh, but these are all mechanisms to uh, collect uh, some material and evidence uh, for um, uh, further accountability work uh, uh, in the future. Uh, I, I think uh, what is needed is more a technical uh, undertaking uh, by institutions like the OPSW, and uh, the work that will be done, if there's the mandate, uh, will be purely technical, uh, and uh, the results will be submitted, of course, to the Executive Council, as well as, as, well as to the UN Security Council, uh, that will be expected to take action, follow-up action. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my, my name is William King. I'm a career retired chemical officer in the U.S. Army and now as an advisor. In your comments, you talked about some of the observations in the way that we got through Syrians' declaration and ultimate destruction and then some of the things we've seen afterwards. Uh, how well is the OPCW leaning forward in preparing to maybe do the same thing, having learned from Syria uh, as, it, as it deals with the future with North Korea? Uh, that's a quick, good question. I think uh, uh, the organization and states parties will have to draw the necessary lessons from the Syria experience. And uh, uh, if there is a, in the future, uh, you know, a decision to eliminate the North Korean chemical weapons program, and uh, looking at the open sources, uh, they, this may be quite a large, uh, actually, program with some large stocks of chemical weapons. Um, and um, a, I, I, I cannot uh, immediately uh, give uh, you know a recipe to uh, you know uh, to to perhaps uh, uh, a roadmap uh, to be followed uh, by by the OPCW and state parties in the case of North Korea. There, there might be some similarities, but uh, a lot of differences too. For for instance, uh, in the Syrian case, uh, it was uh, actually chemical weapons were stored in, in tanks in bulk. Uh, whereas uh, we, uh, we think that the North Korean chemical weapons program or uh, stockpiles might be weaponized and um, filled in munitions, which will take, in fact, uh, a longer time and uh, a lot of technical work and investment uh, to uh, dis destroy uh, these, these stockpiles. But in addition to that, uh, the, uh, the work uh, to be, uh, you know, technical work to be undertaken by the uh, OPSW to make sure that uh, North Korea will uh, declare everything it possessed in relation to its chemical weapons program uh, might, might be uh, challenging, uh, as it happened to be the case in the Syrian case. And uh, this will uh, require a lot of preparations before the uh, project starts. So um, I, again, I, I don't have an immediate response, but uh, we face difficulties with the uh, Syrian authorities on this. Uh, there were some mismatches between the uh, stockpiles of chemicals as, as well and uh, the delivery means. Uh, there were some uh, discoveries as a result of samples collected by that in several places in Syria, which indicated the presence of uh, some chemicals which were never declared by the uh, Syrian government. Uh, they finally agreed to declare uh, the SSRC research um, laboratory or facilities, uh, which uh, we were sure that uh, uh, were involved, in fact, in R&D activities in relation to its chemical weapons program, uh, but it took some time to, to obtain all these results, and uh, as I said, uh, it's not yet full. Thank you. Stefano Costanzio, American University. Uh, you mentioned in your address the importance of verification regimes for, for non-proliferation, especially in the industrial sector. So I was wondering if you uh, have any ideas on how to uh, strengthen verification regimes, especially in light of the dual-use uh, nature of, uh, of chemicals. 
Um, that's quite a challenge. Um, the uh, chemical industry, in fact, was involved in the negotiation phase of the uh, convention, and uh, they have been uh, quite cooperative over the past 21 years of its uh, existence and implementation of the convention. Uh, so the on-site inspections, as well as uh, the uh, declarations of uh, production, the transfers of dual-use chemicals are, are being done, uh, and uh, they are monitored by the technical sector, but there are some discrepancies uh, quite often uh, that needs to be addressed and uh, uh, reconciled. Uh, so they, there is a, a need, I believe, uh, to strengthen uh, the uh, actually the uh, capabilities of the uh, Secretariat in this regard, but also uh, better, uh, in fact, uh, awareness of uh, such issues uh, among the chemical industry associations, uh, which are, um, and also the national authorities in every state party. Uh, so this requires a collective effort, and uh, I believe that there is also a need to adapt this uh, uh, verification regime uh, to meet the new security challenges, especially uh, the possible production and use of um, um, chemical weapons by non-state actors. So definitely the diversion, uh, the access to such chemicals must be prevented. And um, uh, clearly uh, this belongs, uh, this is the responsibility of state parties to take the necessary measures at domestic level to develop the necessary legislations and enforce them uh, at national level. Uh, but uh, we, we are not yet there. There are 70 countries uh, among 193 uh, that have no legislation, no a mechanism, uh, in fact, to, to enforce the, the convention. This creates uh, significant gaps around the world. Uh, prohibited activities which may take place in such countries may uh, adverse, uh, adversely affect the security of uh, other countries. So there is a, a need, in fact, to mobilize uh, those countries. The Secretariat is, uh, is doing its utmost, utmost within its means and capabilities uh, to improve this, uh, the situation, uh, but I think uh, the state parties will have to make an effort in this regard. Thank you. Okay, in the far back corner. Amy Smithson, first of all, allow me to congratulate you and also to thank you on a remarkable tenure during very difficult times, the Nobel very richly deserved. Um, my question has to do with whether or not we're seeing history repeating itself and whether or not it might repeat itself again with a potential situation in North Korea. Uh, when Saddam Hussein made declarations about his weapons programs inside the United Nations Special Commission, they were known as full, final, and complete fairy tales. There were a number of discrepancies and intent to restart the program, all sorts of things that the inspectors found along the way. And I'm tremendously impressed that you've been able to do this again in Syria. What other lessons can we draw from the Iraqi experience with the international inspectors that might guide your successor? Uh, um, thank, thank you, Amy, for your kind remarks. Um, I, of course, I, I, I won't be able to share everything that I intend to share with my successor <laughs> uh, here publicly. Uh, but um, uh, this requires, um, uh, I think, uh, a lot of determination, perseverance, patience uh, on, the, on, on the part of the Secretariat, uh, but as well as uh, a, on the part of um, uh, states' parties. So, uh, I, I think uh, the, uh, you know, in such uh, uh, cases, uh, there, there, there needs to be um, uh, continuous pressure on the, on those countries concerned. Uh, so um, uh, the the Syrian authorities recognise that uh, they they should, uh, after several rounds of discussions on the declaration, realise that uh, uh, they they should uh, be more transparent in order to, uh, you know, to raise some confidence uh, with other states parties and uh, uh, to be more transparent and so on. Uh, this helped, but uh, I, I had to have three long rounds of discussions with the vice minister and delegations in The Hague and um, uh, several visits by our declaration team. Uh, and a lot of communications, and there are still some uh, points that I sent um, a few weeks ago that need to be answered by the Syrian authorities, and it takes time. So uh, the, 
the argument that they have been using is was that the Syria was in the midst of a conflict and there were no documents. Uh, the experts who were involved were not available. Uh, and therefore, and the, the program was compartmentalized because of its secrecy, uh, and, uh, and not everyone was aware of the whole program. So all these uh, were, were used as arguments. And uh, uh, while well, uh, you, you may recognize some of them, but uh, still, uh, we found out that there were some documents, actually, which were made available later on. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a quite, a, uh, I should say, time-consuming um, exercise, uh, which has been partially successful, but not entirely. Uh, so I, I, I believe that there are lessons that we should draw as secretariat, but also states parties while, while handling the new uh, states parties. Well, thank you very much uh, for the excellent questions as well. I need to draw this section to a close and invite our other speakers up. But first, join me in thanking the Director General for your uh, support. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think well, this will give us an opportunity to continue the conversation. I think was beautifully teed up by the Director General, hitting a lot of the key points. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be able to welcome you all here. Um, you know, it's, it, it is in many ways natural to sort of bring together uh, this sort of a P3 uh, discussion on an issue like this for so many reasons, but who really, you know, there's so much more to it, right? I mean, from the French perspective, bringing in uh, and, and launching this past year the international partnership for the uh, role and welcoming a, a new member of the, of the US team. I'll get to some introductions at, at the UK to be both uh, a leader on the issue and a victim. Um, it's kind of a remarkable statement. So I'm sure we'll, we'll tease out a lot of that, but let me do my first job of introducing to you all our outstanding speakers, and then we'll have a bit of a dialogue. And after some of that discussion with me, I'll invite you all to participate as well. So first I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Yelem Poblet, and uh, she is the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control Verification and Compliance. She was sworn in as Assistant Secretary on April 30th, 2018, as we're very pleased to welcome you here to CSIS. It might be your first time here in it, your career. It is, it's actually my very first engagement. Well, <laughs> we're honored that you uh, chose us. Uh, she joins the State Department after a very distinguished career in public service that includes several U.S. government posts at the Department of State, the White House, as well as over two decades in the U.S. House of Representatives, mostly on the Committee on Foreign Affairs, where she rose to the role of Chief of Staff. She's led a number of important issues and brings a wealth of experience, so welcome very much to you. I would also like to welcome Samantha Joe. She is a counselor for, the, uh, for foreign and security policy here at the British Embassy in Washington, covers a variety of issues, again, a long career in the field. Uh, she is the foreign and security policy counselor. She's worked on issues ranging from the Middle East process, Middle East peace process to inter the International Criminal Court, led policy formulations from, in terms of <coughs> counterproliferation, EU defense and security policy and counterterrorism. Uh, prior to 2016, she was the joint head of the North Africa Department in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London. And finally, to my immediate right, I'm pleased to welcome Nicolas Roche, who is the Director of Strategic Affairs, Security and Disarmament at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was a Director for Strategy and Policy at uh, the Military Applications Division of the French Atomic Energy Commission was appointed to the private office of the Minister of Defense as a diplomatic advisor as well, and has again served a number of important roles um, and is uh, well known to, to CSIS and much of this community for his work over many years and uh, great contributions. So we could not have a better lineup. And thank you for all making time for this important issue. I know you have so many issues on your plate, so thank you for demonstrating that. You know, as we tried to describe in the video, it's kind of shocking to be at this point, you know, a hundred years in, 
decades into the Chemical Weapons Convention, having left a period of time now probably less than a decade ago when we thought perhaps this was the end of the Chemical Weapons Challenge and it was just about mopping up and cleaning up and finishing up some destruction, including some of our own, and here we are facing more use, more diverse sets of use in a variety of situations, seeing changing utility. It doesn't really look like the chemical weapons threat is going away. And yet the attention on the issue has been fairly light. Um, it's difficult in terms of the international you know, um, uh, think tank community and civil society it doesn't seem to, hasn't at least had a whole lot of, uh, of interest. And some of those reactions, at least until quite recently, were pretty muted. Um, pretty episodic. And so here we are on the cusp of this meeting next week. It's really, you know, kind of precedent setting. Just a few months after the launch of the French initiative, we seem to be at a critical juncture. So I guess, why do you think we have faced such a challenge in bringing attention to this issue and focus both inside and outside of governments and institutions? And what do you think is most important to change that? Anyone dying to go first? <laughs> Nicola, you want to dive yeah. in and then we'll go sure, from there? Sure, sure, with pleasure. Uh, th thanks thanks uh, so much first, Rebecca, for this event, for uh, giving us also the opportunity of hearing the Director General and, and the uh, remarkable speech and, and for the report. Uh, my first answer to your question is that it's, it's just bad news uh, that we are so many in that room uh, that you published such a report uh, and that we devote so much time and energy to this question. It's bad news because it means uh, that chemical weapons use has become first and front uh, in our international security agenda. And that was not the case many years ago. Many years ago, it was just a bunch of experts uh, in much smaller rooms uh, getting together uh, and doing their, their job. Uh, so, so I think we, we need to reflect on that fact. Uh, that the, the very fact that chemical weapons uh, questions have become so prominent on the international agenda is, is something of a shock. Where, where I would slightly disagree with you, I mean, s s just from my own personal experience, is that we, we, I mean, I don't get any difficulty to get uh, my uh, political authorities' attention uh, because they have fully understood, my minister, my president, have fully understood what is at stake here. And, and I think. This is not just that we are seeing uh, a number of uh, uses of chemical weapons. It, the whole nature of the problem we face has changed. And I would say in, in at least three directions. Uh, we used to consider chemical weapons uh, as uh, weapons of mass destruction, as, as part of that category. But the fact is that we are seeing uh, now tactical use uh, of those weapons almost on a daily basis on theaters of operations. And that's a major change. This is not the chemical weapons problem we faced during the Cold War, for example. Okay. This is really about daily use or almost daily use of those kind of indiscriminate weapons on a theater of operation for tactical gains, tactical military gains. That's the first change, and we see that in Syria uh, almost every day. The second change uh, is uh, that the prospect of uh, chemical terrorism has risen. Uh, so we know as a fact now, based on the, the, the work of the OPCW and the GIM, uh, that a terrorist organization, Daesh, uh, has produced and used chemical weapons uh, against civilians in urban warf warfare also. That, that's a second fundamental change. Uh, and the third one is that this is not something that is far away uh, in places uh, that are not very close to uh, the, the, our citizens. Uh, now we have just witnessed uh, a chemical weapons use uh, in, against civilians in a major European city. Uh, and that's also a major change. So those three elements together boils down to a very simple statement. Uh, this, is, and this has become back a national security question for the highest political authorities of my country. Uh, and and, and that's, that's the kind of challenge we need to face. So that's why we need to pose uh, and think about what needs to be done these days, at this very moment, uh, to confront that new challenge that is of a different nature now. Thank you. And Rebecca, is, if yes, I could please. just uh, build off of that. First, uh, to the fact that we thought that it had been taken care of. As uh, the Director General 
has mentioned, there was a, a propensity, a knee-jerk reaction to uh, go into a law of acceptance and tranquility. What uh, I believe that we, the lessons that we can extrapolate from that process and from that transition is that from a verification standpoint is that you can never trust that it has come to an end. So I think it provides us an impetus for greater verification, uh, greater attribution uh, mechanisms, uh, greater dedication to the technical expertise. That said, if I could just go into the use, the chemical terrorism, and the use in major European city, I'd like to frame it just within the narrow construct of the last uh, two years and what the United States has done. First, starting with the last point uh, that Nicholas raised, the first pillar of the U.S. national security strategy is in fact countering weapons of mass destruction. It's not just an abstract term, it's not an abstract priority, but it truly is brought into a convergence from a foreign policy perspective as well as from a homeland security perspective. So when you look at the national security strategy, you look at just the first page of the depth of the document, the analytical part of the document, you have front and center a hyper-focus, an emphasis on countering the, the totality of these weapons, whether they be chemical weapons, biological weapons, radiological weapons, or nuclear weapons. From that, I have to also echo what uh, Nicholas says, and I'm sure Samantha will say the same. As far as our political authorities, I think President Trump and the United States government as a whole, uh, from early into this administration, clearly articulated that the United States will not tolerate the use of chemical weapons anywhere, at any time, by any actor, whether it's a state actor or it's a non-state actor. Beyond that, uh, we're also seeking accountability from the enablers, from those who are obstructionists, from those who facilitate, who seek to cover up the crimes of uh, the aggressors, the violators, such as the Syrian regime. Uh, when you look at the panoply of options uh, that you actually mention in the report, and you look at what the United States has done in the last year and a half, uh, perhaps just over a year and a half, working unilaterally as well as with our uh, P3 partners and responsible partners, like-minded nations uh, throughout, uh, they sent to mirror what uh, some of the recommendations that you propose and the menu that you include. We have engaged at a political level, at a diplomatic level. We have sought to educate the American people on the gross uses of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime, but more generally, more broadly, about the destructive nature of these weapons and how we cannot tolerate that uh, at a just basic level, we have imposed sanctions on the Syrian regime, on the DPRK, on individuals in Syria who were responsible and are engaged in the use of chemical weapons. We have imposed sanctions on uh, the, uh, the DPRK under the Chemical and Biological Weapons Act. Uh, this is going beyond just the broadest possible sanctions regime that we have in place against the DPRK. We have expelled uh, Russian personnel. We worked in tandem with the 20 plus other countries to ensure that it was a robust response. We have utilized uh, military action both last year, just a few months into this new leadership, this new administration, as well as uh, earlier this year with our two allies uh, in response to the Duma attack. So, Yes, uh, we are in a crisis, but I want to underscore that the United States government uh, in its totality, as well as our partners represented here and many other responsible nations, are acutely aware of the responsibility to engage very proactively across 
all spheres, across all sectors uh, to ensure accountability. And one last point, uh, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but there was something that was uh, very uh, interesting that the Director General raised, and that is the issue of compromise. But he also, in, in my estimation, and forgive me if I misinterpret it, uh, drew a distinction between consensus and, and compromise. And we have to be cautious that consensus does not become the enemy of the good. Uh, and if there is a, a commitment or a focus simply on consensus, uh, let us not forget that there are these national means as the Director General underscored and as you've underscored in the report. So we will see cooperation. We will certainly look to work together and that is the importance and the value of the impunity initiative. But we cannot forget the individual responsibility of each nation to ensure accountability and to ensure that the message is clear that it will not be tolerated under any circumstances. If I could just pick yes. up one point of that, um, in Nicola's descriptions of where we are and the challenges, I think certainly in the last couple of years, one of those challenges is absolutely, as the French have identified, the impunity one. And that is something we are all deeply concerned about and we're trying to do something about. <laughs> I think for us, an illustration that uh, quite how broad that concern is internationally is when uh, we, with our group of um, close partners, uh, invited people to a special session of the Conference of State Parties, we reached the necessary threshold in only a couple of days. And that was 60, 65 people we needed. We had more than that in two, two and a half days. And, and I take heart from that because mm -hmm. that is a sign of how concerned the international community is, how much they want to come together and you know, make a shift, including a vouch of very strong support for the, for the organization itself. Just to kind of add to that and ask you all about what's next, because I do think there is some marked change, even from not you know less than a year ago, uh, in late 2017, when we were seeing such difficulty moving in the OPCW. You had the dismantlement of the gym. You had the complete sort of collapse, really, of the international process to deal with this. It seems to have definitely taken the problem getting worse before we could perhaps see the turn to the problem getting better. But we are at the cusp. I mean, next week's very important. So I would like to ask each of you to, to talk a bit more about, OK, what do we need to do? Um, what are some of those critical next steps, um, both in terms of the partnership, in terms of broader international engagement, the role of the United States, um, but also in terms of the special session next week? Um, maybe, Samantha, I'll go to you first to kind of take that one on, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, on the special session next week, I think it's, it's an opportunity for that breadth and depth of international uh, strength of feeling to come together, to be expressed very clearly, and a vouch of um, support and sort of recommitment and reconfirmation both to the policy issue and to the um, ideals and extremely good work of the OPCW. So there is, we hope, uh, an opportunity for that political leadership that we heard about to come together and take a decision uh, which does a few things. For us, one of the important things is to recognize and preserve the extremely good technical work which the OPCW Secretariat has done. So that work that was done for the gym itself, we don't want it lost because yes. political realities uh, took the gym in a particular direction. So information sharing, you know, not losing that incredibly good work. Where can it go? How can we um, make the most of that is one of them. Second is attribution, as we just heard. For us, that's absolutely critical. If you look at uh, I was framing this for myself last night, and I was thinking, what if this was a police investigation? You know, the, there was a, a, some individual on the floor who'd been shot. Okay? The fact finders would tell us they had been shot. There was a gun. Uh, they died from their wounds, kind of the forensic bit. But unless the detective comes along and says, this, whose gun it, this is whose gun it was, this is who drove up just beforehand, or this is who drove up just afterwards, the attribution part is absolutely critical to getting us to where we want ultimately to be, which is sort of in court doing the the accountability part. So we be very much behind the, um, the drive to, to push the attribution part. We think that is strengthening what the OPCW has already started doing under the gym. It's not a whole new thing. It's a, a strengthening in a new direction. And building on that, we do want to see um, new uh, political and financial support for the OPCW. And we want to, um, as part of that, uh, we're hoping to put in more financial support. We hope others will do the same. But we also want to support 
that part, which perhaps we haven't talked about yet, but is relevant to your uh, non-state actor issue, which is the support for member states. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, very important that the Secretariat is able to do that, that member states ask for that help and, and do their implementing legislation. Uh, and so that part of it, just strengthening the whole international network, uh, is also important to us. Could I ask you just one quick follow-on? Mm -hmm. When we were working on this report, and again, going back a number of months, one of the challenges that kept coming up um, especially in terms of the broader international community, and I think it relates to the number of countries who stepped up and said, yes, we will come to this meeting. There was a real concern that in a number of, uh, a number of countries, the, the level of knowledge and experience, the depth of expertise, the bench, was really sort of lacking to a point, or perhaps not present um, in The Hague in their, in their sort of national representation. Not Most countries don't have a designated <laughs> national representative. Um, that that was really an impediment because it was kind of stymieing the ability to, to make progress and get strong national views and get capitals engaged. Have you seen a change with that? Um, is that still a deficit? Because that speaks to things broader communities can do to help as well. Yep. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, I just wanted to build, up, uh, build off of what has been said and focusing on the uh, Conference of State Parties next week. I can speak for myself, but I think uh, for my colleagues here, that we have been working very closely uh, in trying to secure that support, in trying to educate uh, regions of, uh, of the world, specific countries within specific regions who are interested, who are supportive of the CSP, but as you mentioned, perhaps do not have the background, do not have the knowledge of First, the work of the OPCW. Uh, secondly, the issues that would be addressed at the Conference of State Parties. Uh, just in the last uh, two weeks, we have engaged representatives from the Western Hemisphere, from uh, Africa, from uh, the Middle East, uh, and, and again, other regions. We've had an ongoing series of discussions uh, at lower levels, at uh, higher levels. So. We are acutely aware that we do need to fill that information gap or that technical gap uh, in some instances, and we are working together, maximizing contacts, maximizing resources uh, and background to ensure that we do have that commitment, that we do have broad as possible participation at the CSP next week to, again, telegraph, underscore, that we are committed, we responsible nations are committed to achieving the necessary attribution, verification uh, processes uh, to counter impunity. Thank you. Just on the, uh, did you yeah, want I mean, to touch on I'm, that one? That I was one simply going to say, of, of course, point. we understand that not every country has a foreign service the size that three of us are privileged to have. Um, so there is a, a, a question about education and support and technical support. And if your underlying question was going to be, can civil society help? Absolutely yes, <laughs> because there is an education uh, piece out there. But we do want to build this up as a partnership. What we find is there's a kind of gut reaction of God. Yes, you know, we must do something to strengthen it. And then the, the education part can, can come with that. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, there's a role for um, OCW in having those conversations and encouraging um, at, uh, in capitals as well as uh, through the diplomatic community such that, as it is. Right, right. Well, hopefully you'll reach a point where certain basic education things are less problematic than they've been in the past. I mean, at one point in the Syria file, um, just again reminding countries who are actually states parties that the use of chlorine as a weapon yes. is absolutely prohibited by the treaty. It was amazing the amount yes. of work that had to go into basic facts. Um, so I, I, I hope that's far less needed, but I would be surprised if it wasn't needed at all because it's just a constant effort. Um, but so Nicola, you know, talking about next week and, and what do we need to do, but also could you draw in the partnership a bit and mm -hmm. how will these things work together? Mm -hmm. How are they compatible as opposed to contradictory? Uh, it's, yeah, it's actually more than compatible. It's mutually reinforcing the way we view it. Um, but if I may take one step back, I mean, 
President Macron, when he was in, in Washington during his state visit, he, he delivered a, a passionate speech at the, at the Congress. The whole purpose of the speech was about effective multilateralism. And this is exactly what is at the core of what we are trying to do together now. Mm -hmm. So we have on the one side the challenge uh, that I described in terms of the changing nature of the chemical weapons threat. On the other side, we have a chemical weapons non-proliferation regime that has esta been established progressively uh, over the last decades. Uh, but it's, it's under threat. It's under threat uh, because uh, there are gaps. Uh, and the attribution one is, is, is key. But there are threats also because there are temptations from time to time to undermine the impartiality and independence of those uh, instances. The gym first, now the OPCW, the FFM. And so I think, I think the, the multilateral regime as a whole is a, is a greater good uh, that, that we should continue to promote, sustain, support, and strengthen. And so what we have tried to do over the last month is precisely uh, this, uh, bringing together uh, our understanding of the changing nature of the chemical weapons threat, that this is not something far away, this is not something that we should undermine, this is something extremely real that is directly at the core of our national security interests on the one side, uh, and that we have a good international uh, uh, set of instruments, of multilateral instruments that only need support and strengthening. Uh, and so the whole question is how we do it. And, and, and we got two answers to that. Uh, one is the partnership. Uh, the other one is what we are trying to do together with the, the special CSP. The partnership is, is a very basic idea. I mean, we, we don't pretend that to reinvent the wheel, right? It's, it's a very informal political gathering uh, of experts, uh, of uh, governments and, and nations. Now we are 23 and the, the, the number is growing by the day. So we receive a lot of new applications, which is good news because precisely that's an answer to your question. People, nations, governments really understand, really understand the nature of the challenge. And so they, they want to join in and be part of that. Um, what do we do as, as members of the, the partnership? This, it, is, it is very simple and it's on the state of principles that we have established in January. This is about uh, things as simple as trying to collect and preserve information on chemical weapons use. Uh, we have information, resources, so we, we gather that. Then when we have, once we have gathered those elements and information about chemical weapons use, the second element is we try to share them uh, among ourselves uh, and with the relevant in international uh, bodies. Uh, for when we decided to have a special meeting, which is very unfortunate because the, the, uh, the news were uh, asking for it, unfortunately, uh, on May the 18th, uh, we were very clear that we wanted to share those information uh, that we had on Salisbury, uh, on Syria and the Duma attack with the relevant uh, uh, bodies. So, uh, as an observer, uh, the uh, OPCW was there, in, in, and it was, it's not a member because it's, it, we, ha we, we need to preserve the impartiality and independence of the OPCW, but we were ready to share the information so that it can process the information with the methods that it has. It's the same with the IIIM. It's the same with uh, uh, President Pinheiro was there for the Pinheiro Commission. So there are a number of instances where we can, uh, we as nations, as governments, uh, share information. Uh, and then it's up to these bodies and institutions to, to do what they, what they want to do. But our responsibility is to bring our resources to the plate. Um, then it's about precisely fighting impunity. And, and there are different ways we can do that. There is one way that we do uh, at a national or regional basis, which is uh, uh, simply to hold accountable uh, individuals, organizations that have used chemical weapons. And so this is about for us designations. This is about sanctions. We have, uh, as a nation, as France, uh, designated a number of individuals that we believe were involved in the chemical weapons attack in Syria in January and in May. And we will continue to do so. We have published a watch list uh, of uh, uh, entities and individuals that were, uh, we believe, from our own sources, involved in those chemical weapons attacks. Um, and there is a last element, and that's the link, the bridge between the partnership and the CSP. That's the, the political discussion. Uh, we, we know how the multilateral regime works. Uh, we have institutions, and then we need political will to use these institutions. Uh, and, and I think the Director General explained extremely clearly the difference between the role of the technical secretariat uh, and its technical uh, legal expertise and the role of governments uh, as uh, 
uh, the lead uh, uh, political uh, responsible uh, for taking decisions. Mm -hmm. And so what the partnership tries to do is bring together a group of countries uh, to think together about what needs to be done, what is the political will uh, that we collectively have to strengthen and support the multilateral regime. And so what we decided to do in May was precisely to use the multilateral framework we have, which is absolutely critical to our national security interests, which is the CW3 and the upper CW. And we have a, a CSP, so let's use it. This is as simple as that. <laughs> we have a CSP where all the, all the member states, uh, all the state parties to the convention can gather together uh, and think about what kind of decisions are needed. Uh, and this is simply what, what we do. Uh, and then very much as uh, Ilem and, and Samantha mentioned, uh, we see two or three things that, that really needs to be done and we need to gather that political will for that objective. It's simply to restate the obvious, that there is an interdiction norm uh, and that we must condemn all chemical weapons used anywhere, anytime, by whoever. The, the question of who is behind is less important than the uh, condemnation by all uh, of that. The second element is if we want to have accountability, we need to have first technical attribution. Uh, there, is no, there is no way uh, we will sustain, support, strengthen the multilateral regime if we do not close that gap that the Director General mentioned. Uh, we had an attribution mechanism in New York. That was perfect, that was the gym. Now it's dead. We will continue to try our efforts in New York, and, and that's exactly what we did together as a PE3, mm -hmm. uh, immediately after the, uh, the strikes that our three leaders decided to move back on, on the Sunday afternoon after the strikes. We decided to move back to New York, to restart the process in New York, to relaunch the process, to regather uh, consensus and unanimity around that major challenge that faces uh, all of us. And we will continue to do that, but we cannot simply accept inaction. We cannot simply accept that we do not act together. So if, if the route is blocked in New York, we'll find another one. Uh, if the route is blocked in the OPCW Executive Council, we'll find another one. Because there is one thing that is absolutely sure, that in inaction is, is really not an option. And so we have one route. There is a legal basis. There is a multilateral system that we all share. It's called CWC. It has the legal basis inside the convention for doing that. We have a technical body that has done its job perfectly well. So we have all the, the different bits and pieces. The only thing we need is political will to put them together and create some uh, attribution arrangements. Right. And the last element is also what was mentioned. We, we tend to forget uh, uh, from time to time that words have a meaning. And when we have uh, a technical body like the technical secretary that, that says um, that Syria, in Syria's statement and initial declaration, there are gaps and inconsistencies. And once again, words have a meaning, gaps and inconsistencies. And that as a result, once again, words have a meaning. The OPCW technical secretary cannot confirm the accuracy and the completeness of the declaration. That means something. And so we have to think about how to strengthen the verification and ins inspection regime uh, of the OPCW to be adapted to the challenges of the day. And once again, we have a formidable instrument, which is the CWC. We only need the political will to use it uh, to face the common challenge. Right. So indeed, it seems, you know, I mean, inaction is, is, is actually an invitation to use. And I think that that is in part, you know, what we've been seeing. And it will take certainty of response uh, to make sure that the message is received, that, you know, and restraints kind of, kind of reinforced. Um, I, I'm sure you both want to pick up some of those threads, but I'm wondering if I could move us a little bit to another problem, uh, perhaps on the, on the horizon. Um, I'd like to talk a minute about North Korea. Uh, Obviously, we have the case of you know, this kind of unusual use of a nerve agent uh, as an assassination tool. But contextually, and I think the Director General sort of teed this up, we have the remarkable circumstances coming out of the Singapore summit and perhaps consideration of the need to address uh, uh, North Korea's chemical weapons program as part of some broader um, denuclearization. Whether or not that comes to pass, we certainly hope at some point that North Korea could be brought into this system, but the challenges are sort of enormous as well. Um, I was wondering if I could just first uh, turn to you, uh, Assistant Secretary Boulet, on that, kind of both in terms of what have we done in the past and, and sanctions and how we see that, but how do you sort of see this issue playing out um, and whether you think it'll be addressed uh, in the dialogue with North Korea? 
Well, first, I'd like to pick up on a little bit of uh, what uh, Nicholas just said in leading to a discussion on the DPRK. The bureau that I'm fortunate to lead, the Arms Control Verification and Compliance Bureau, has a very similar role within the policy community, within, uh, with the intelligence community, uh, within the broader national security interagency in the United States government, uh, in being the verification and compliance, a very technical bureau, statutorily created for that very purpose. We are the ones who provide that, uh, for lack of a better term, the objective naysayer role. We're not uh, being guided by any particular policy outcome. We go in, we monitor, we investigate, we verify, and sometimes we cannot certify that there is compliance or non-compliance. We build the case as has been discussed and then present it to the very senior uh, leadership uh, to decide what to do next. But uh, we are partly independent even though we are in the political, uh, in a policy political agency of the United States government. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, because it's the perfect segue to the DPRK discussion. First, uh, just building off of uh, what Secretary Pompeo has said, I want to underscore that uh, leading up to the summit in Singapore, the experts were consulted. There was a vast, a comprehensive, an ongoing uh, discussion amongst the interagency. Uh, I could just cite my very first week after being confirmed, I had at least four interagency meetings just on North Korea alone. That's not counting the number of interagency meetings on CW deterrence and accountability and, and how to combat uh, CW. So I wanted to first highlight that. Uh, as far as what the goals are, I again must underscore that US policy going into the summit is the same as US policy coming out of the summit. It continues to be the complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. And going in and coming out, there is still a focus on the totality of unconventional weapons threats posed by the DPRK. When we refer specifically to chemical and biological weapons, uh, again, the president, the secretary have made it clear that there are a number of UN Security Council resolutions uh, dictating what d the DPRK must do with respect to chemical and biological weapons. The starting point is it must come into compliance with these uh, UN Security Council resolutions. And uh, again, as to the role that uh, will be played at what point, uh, and in what way by international organizations. That is part of the discussion. No determinations have been made, but I must clarify that the, the president, the secretary of state, the totality of the US government uh, are acutely focused on all the threats posed by the DPRK, all the actions that have been undertaken the specific use of a Schedule I nerf agent uh, by the DPRK against a DPRK national uh, is integrated into the discussion. All of the uh, prior cases, whether it's uh, South Africa, the Iraq situation, the Libya dismantlement, uh, Syria, CW, uh, just the gamut, even traditional arms control uh, verification mechanisms, all have been evaluated. We continue to try and extrapolate lessons from each and every case to try and avoid, prevent repeating those mistakes. When we discuss the uh, gaps, deficiencies, uh, in the Syria declaration, again, this is at the forefront of our discussions going into the uh, DPRK verification construct, uh, dismantlement, denuclearization construct. 
we look at a declaration as something that needs to be verified. So we're looking at verification from the onset. And when we look at the irreversible nature of uh, the DPRK denuclearization, uh, we're also looking at lessons learned in something that the Director General mentioned when he first assumed his, uh, his current post, and that is even if something we believe at this particular moment uh, has in fact met the denuclearization threshold, we are going into this with eyes wide open. Uh, so we are cognizant of the fact that uh, we need to also consider what comes after that mission has been accomplished to ensure that irreversible nature. Thank you. We've, I want to hit a couple of other areas, but do either of you want to touch on this North Korea question for the for now? If I were to reflect on which have been, <clears throat> should we say, the more successful uh, over the last 20, 30 years, there's a fundamental question here about political will of the administration going into the giving up of their program. Um, and I think that's the thing which the international community is still waiting to see in this case. And I think that is very much uh, where we all want to be. And we are absolutely um, aligned with the full denuclearization, you know, the real permanent end to these programs. Um, and I think that's still uh, being tested. And that's what we will have to see. If you have, um, you're looking at the programs of a state which has taken that strategic decision and are opening doors and inviting inspectors, that's a very different proposition from Assyria, which was kind of doing it reluctantly and you know, busily trying to hide things. So we don't yet know which of those it's going to be, um, but there are absolutely lots of experts around to help. Thank you. No, no just a, sh a short comment, because I think uh, Ilem said it all. Um, the, the, and I think you very rightly so emphasize uh, the fact that uh, what guides you and what the famous CVID uh, is actually a very broad definition of the kind of objectives that we all share. And, and that is based um, on layers and layers of UNSC resolution and decisions. Uh, and, uh, and so I think we have a construct here. Uh, and and uh, the extremely important and significant uh, summit that just took place is, as was mentioned very clearly by your president and your secretary of state, is the beginning of the process. And so you've made very clear, I think, for all of us what your objectives are, uh, which we actually share uh, as part of that construct that we have actually built mm -hmm. together as P3 mm -hmm. uh, in New York for many, many years. So we know pretty well where we want to go. I was in New York when we did the first uh, DPRK Security Council resolution, and there was this moment where we had the P5 ambassadors in the room, um, all kind of you know, P5 ambassadors, you know, they're all big beasts, sort of struggling and negotiating. Uh, and then there was a single moment where they came together and said, no, we need to do this, and we need to do this now. Um, and I still remember that some years later, as of that uh, the international community really coming together individuals who fought each other daily on all kinds of other issues, um, saying, no, no, this is, this is not right. This needs to change. Well, that is actually the perfect segue to my next question in terms of thinking about how to actually revisit a day on these issues when we might actually see some degree of P5 unity. Um, in this case, it seems, especially with Russia, so many roads and not all of them positive lead there. Critical as a partner, unfortunately, seems to have engaged in enabling behavior and perhaps more. And that's so disturbing. Um, so it's so challenging. I can't really imagine and the, the talk about how to get back to the enforcement responsibilities of the Security Council um, and to do so effectively on behalf of the international community, which is really dependent on that for the multilateral you know, kind of support for international peace and security. And as you said, Nicola, this is an international peace and security issue, which is why the attention is now squarely there. So here we have this situation. As you look at the challenge with Russia, you know, how, how do you see yourselves navigating this? How, what paths for potential partnership, for realization that there is common ground is still possible? How do we manage um, the challenge from, from your perspective uh, to, to sort of get there um, under incredibly difficult circumstances? So is there any hope 
for rebuilding a path of cooperation. And while there isn't cooperation now, what else can be done? And how do you see yourselves navigating this very difficult diplomatic challenge? Who would like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just can uh, kickstart that part of the discussion. Um, because the answer is pretty simple. We engage and we move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there is no point hiding the divergences we have. Uh, my president was in St. Petersburg not a uh, long time ago. Uh, he had a very extensive discussion with uh, President Putin on this, and it, it was made clear at the press conference at the end that they engaged on this, uh, that they were not uh, seeing eye to eye, to say the least. Uh, but that was a must, and we will continue to engage, because that's part of what we do as diplomats. Um, and and I, I strongly believe that at the end of the day, and we strongly believe that at the end of the day, the uh, uh, importance of uh, the issue uh, and the responsibility of what uh, of the P5 uh, as a whole in terms of the preservation of international peace and security is more important than anything else. And so we hope that we will, ca we will be able down the road to converge on precisely strengthening the uh, regime that we cherish, which is the CWC, the OPCW, the UNSC. But once again, while we are doing this, uh, we will not accept inaction. And so we will move forward, whatever happens. But so these are, the, and this is what I mentioned with the partnership with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the special CSP. Uh, and that's that kind of balance. Uh, we, uh, we, we do uh, uh, that all, all the day. Um, and my minister and my president, uh, they will continue to engage with their Russian counterpart everywhere. We do it in The Hague, we do it in New York, we do it bilaterally, we do it at every level. We will continue to do so because that's, that's a must. Um, and, and I hope, we hope that one day uh, down the road we will reconverge at, on, on that basic element that we, we have in, in our hands, uh, the responsibility for the multilateral regime in charge of international peace and security. But, but this is not an either or. We can so not simply wait and see. Uh, we do this and we move forward with every instrument we have to strengthen the multilateral regime. Because at the end of the day, that's an international peace and security question, and that's a national security question. Indeed. And if I could Please. just uh, build off of that, uh, just this week, uh, at the expert level, the United States is engaging the, its Russian counterparts uh, within the construct of the uh, INF bilateral experts meeting. Uh, we continue to engage, whether it's on the Open Skies Treaty or New START, treaty issues, uh, as well as a broader range of uh, issues that are priority to, uh, priorities to both the United States and the Russian Federation, uh, and our priorities for our allies uh, throughout the world, particularly in the European theater. Uh, that said, uh, building off of uh, many of the comments that, that have been made up to this point, uh, inaction is unacceptable. Uh, we, as responsible nations, uh, have united and must continue to unite to offset the detrimental effect of the Russian Federation's actions, whether it be at the UN Security Council uh, or at the OPCW. Uh, we all saw what happened and how the Russian alliance of uh, the Russian Federation, Iran, Syria, and other similar uh, types of uh, pariahs, uh, how it interfered with uh, forward momentum and forward progress at last year's uh, Executive Council meeting of the OPCW. Uh, we don't need to uh, reiterate uh, all of the different actions that the Russian Federation has undertaken uh, to provide cover for the Syrian regime and to prevent uh, any sort of uh, additional accountability uh, and attribution with respect to Syria as well as others. But uh, once again, going back to what has been discussed, all of these issues, all of our efforts, these are not binary choices. We're not engaging on the impunity initiative in isolation of the CSP or in isolation of our national efforts uh, or other longstanding efforts, whether it be at the UN Security Council uh, or other international forums. I'd like to uh, actually note a very hopeful development uh, which illustrates we are making progress. 
and that is uh, a few weeks ago, the uh, Organization of American States had a, its General Assembly meeting here in Washington, D.C. And for the first time ever in the history of this uh, regional body, uh, there was a resolution that included a condemnation on the use of chemical weapons. Uh, so we look at the impunity initiative, we look at some of the national actions, the multilateral actions uh, that have been taken, we look at the CSP, but also we have to look at the progress that we are making even in these regional bodies. Uh, so that we are in the same way that at a technical level we have to build the case and, and Samantha uh, put it uh, just perfectly that it really is building a case uh, for later uh, prosecution, action, uh, in whichever manner that, uh, that will take. Uh, we are also building that political will. Uh, we are using the range of resources that the OPCW affords us, that our individual expertise affords us, the uh, combined expertise affords us to also, as we're building the case uh, for attribution and for accountability on specific uses of CW, we're also building the political will, building that education level uh, that will hopefully contribute to the restoration and strengthening of the international chemical weapons norm, not just for today, not just for tomorrow, not just for the rest of this year, but in the longer term. I'm going to give a slightly different answer. Um, I agree with everything that has just been said about the importance of engaging about the importance of building for the future. But for us, this is, uh, you won't be surprised to hear, very personal. Um, and just to think for a minute about what happened in Salisbury. So a military grade nerve agent, undeclared. Uh, so that's kind of problem number one, that's possession. It was then um, used. Problem number two. It was transported. Problem number three. It was used on our territory. And fourthly, it was used in a way which put civilians, for want of a better expression, ordinary people in, at enormous risk and contaminated the center of one of our um, beautiful towns. So if you imagine you're just with your family, spending a you know, weekend afternoon, you go to the park, you go for pizza, you go to the pub, you don't expect to find on the news that night you've been exposed to a chemical weapon. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing. And in some ways, it's just become part of this sort of the discourse. But actually, just take a minute to think about that. It is absolutely extraordinary. And the level of... Um, political commitment and outrage and international response to that um, can't really be underestimated. Now, none of that is to say that we don't see a role for the P5 or the OPCW or the, you know, the proper engagement with um, international partners which will take us forward. Uh, but we're not going to pretend that that didn't happen. Uh, it's not the first time we've seen an assassination on UK, to on UK soil. Um, I hope very vehemently that it will never happen again. But the strength of how deeply we felt about that is, is not going to go away. Um, it is only one part of the picture compared to the scale of use that we've seen in Syria and the non-state actor use that we've seen in Iraq. You know, obviously, we're in a very different uh, position from um, civilians in those countries. But that level of commitment to say, hang on a minute, this is an international standard to which we have all agreed. And we need to remind ourselves that we've agreed. And we need to be very clear that it is not acceptable either to break the norm, which we consider Russia did in the UK, or to give cover for other people to break the norm. That is not what we set out to do. And our sort of determination to get us back to where we should be in our conviction uh, is very, very strong. I wanted like to clarify, yes, uh, please. as I said in my response, we need to work together in many instances to offset Russian malign <laughs> activities. I, I, I don't want to have uh, any sort of leave the impression that there's any equivocation whatsoever. I, I didn't I take think, one, don't worry. And I think that, uh, <laughs> that the U.S. responds uh, in support of and in coordination with 
uh, your government was abundantly clear uh, in light of the, the numbers of uh, Russian intelligence officers that we expel uh, and our continued sustained efforts uh, to counter Russian malign activities. And, and there are two things which we took away from you, know, you have to find a silver lining somewhere. One was the fantastic support we got from the OPCW. We want to say thank you for um, quickly finding and sharing with us experts who could come and take those samples and send them to um, independent OPCW labs. And the second was the international sort of shared outrage and, uh, and readiness to act that, that that provoked. So we didn't feel alone, actually. We felt very much the international community came behind us and said, you know, we, we support what you're doing. And I don't mean to say we'll never talk to Russia again. You know, we, of course, there are important uh, issues in the world which we wish to engage. But it's going to be a bit tricky for us for a while. <laughs> well, and perfectly understandable. I, I, and I want to just tease out one, one thing, and then I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll circle back on sure. this, because I think we want to talk about the implications of Salisbury going forward. But two specific things, right, that you just, you just mentioned that I think were interesting and important in the aftermath, and that are indeed important lessons in the context of, of future responses, two things were really quite powerful uh, and specific. First were the broad expulsions, but I think so importantly was, and I'm hoping you just give us a little sense of like how you kind of pulled this off as quickly as you did. Um, broad expulsions highly synchronized across a much larger number of countries. I mean, it, I think that the, that was very impactful um, because it was so multilateralized so quickly and in such a synchronized fashion. Um, I don't know that we've had that many times where that has occurred multilaterally to such effect. And, you know, kudos on the one hand, but also, you know, could you unpack a little bit? Second, very important, and that really largely done by the, by the UK government, and for those of us who work on the internet and in the unclassified space and deal with chemical weapons, we appreciate this. The very active role from the beginning in putting information out that's clear, in fighting conspiracy-based and inaccurate information or trolling information, which is such a large part of this substantive space that many of us have to deal with, that was extremely useful. I would be really interested to know how you all built that into your strategy up front. Did you draw any lessons? Those are two very specific things that I'd love to ask you to comment on. So the first one, uh, it was good old fashioned diplomacy. You know, we had conversations. First of all, we were able to move um, uh, very fast. We're a technically capable country that is able to make an attribution. Not everyone is in that position. So we were able to um, reach a sort of, if not 100%, very highly likely uh, conclusion fairly fast, which meant we were able to go to other people and say, we have confidence that we know what we're talking about. And the level of, um, uh, I think, because it was so human and it was so uh, extraordinary and so frankly so outrageous, that, that, that was, there was a very human response from other countries as well, saying, well, imagine this happened in a, country in, in, in a town in your country. But there was a lot of, a very quick talking to a lot of people in a lot of countries. Um, and in every case, the sort of, uh, the moral support for us and then the appetite to say, hang on, this, this has gone far enough. Uh, we want to take action and send a signal. We were very, very pleased with and by, and thank you to anybody who's watching who was part of that. Um, on the second one, I had uh, a running tally on my desk while we were handling this of how many alternative versions of what might have happened. And each day it ticked up, you know, there would be another disinformation from here and another story trapped back to whoever from over here. I think I got to 29. Um, I might be slightly out of date here, but it, it was extraordinary. Yeah. But the fact that we were prepared to call that out and we, would, we were prepared to say, really each time somebody came with another sort of slightly uh, crazy theory so partly we were tracking those stories which helped so we had communications people involved in that um, and then uh, we were prepared to refer to them publicly and just say come on these these are the facts um, but there's another part, part to your public information piece which i think is very interesting and worth thinking about uh, again as we talk about the wider international community response and that is we had a town full of people 
we didn't want to make that town suddenly you know, closed off economically to the rest of the country. No one's ever going to visit it again. There were individual, you know, real people who are not of this world just trying to go about their daily life. So it was very important to us in a sort of civil contingencies, domestic crisis sort of response that we could get as much information, clarity, um, not panicky sort of information, but just facts out to the people of Salisbury about what was going on, what was safe, what was not safe, what to do with their clothes, all of the sort of civil continuously responses. And I think, again, that's the sort of thing where internationally we can help other countries with their resilience and their preparedness um, should something awful happen with them. There are things which we are hoping um, countries will do with their domestic legislation and absolutely will want to support that. But even if they've got political problems with domestic legislation, being prepared and thinking how they would respond also helps with resilience should something bad happen. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think this is a, this is a critical point. I think it does open up. I'm going to, just to let you all know, I'm turning to you in just a minute. We're going we're gonna to wrap up. But I think some of the implications of, of Salisbury, you know, kind of going forward, this issue of access to quality technical advice and information, being able to counter bad information with good information quickly and reliably and in a trustworthy fashion and provide good data and facts in the face of things that are not data and not facts um, is so important and I think actually very, very relevant to the future. Um, so I know you, you two want to chime in on Salisbury, but I think what I'd like us to do is take that in the context of what does this mean, um, undeclared you know, agents, uh, issue, you know, agents that were not on the schedules, use in such circumstances here and you know so help us um, highlight a couple of those things as I as I turn to you all and then get your questions ready. Um, Nicola you were nudging me so no. I think you wanted to no, jump I in. <laughs> no I, I would really like to build on what Samantha said because I think it's extremely important. Uh, at some point actions speak for themselves and that's very much true for what happened in Salisbury uh, as well as for Syria and Duma. So what were those actions? And, and from time to time, it's, it's good to get back to basics and simply state the obvious. What we did was publicize and publish information. Not propaganda, not disinformation, facts. And we did not hide what we knew and what we did not knew. And that's the major difference. So when we are sure, we say we are sure and we explain why. What is the scientific reasoning that leads us to the conclusion? Where we are not completely sure, we say it. We say that there is uh, a number of indications that, that goes in that direction. Then we, we do that as, as professionals, right? We, we say this is, we are mildly confident, highly confident. This is the way we do it. And, and, we, and we publish it. So you, you did it. Uh, for Syria, uh, if we uh, get back a few years before, in 2013, we uh, declassified an intelligence assessment uh, after uh, the Ghouta attack. We did it again uh, uh, one year ago, and we did it again this year. Uh, and we will continue to do it, because we, we want to uh, let everyone know the, the basis on which we take decisions. And that's very important, because that's the best way of countering this information campaign, where this is not, as, as Samantha said, this is not about an alternative version of facts. This is about confusing uh, reality. This is about the obfuscation of truth. And so our responsibility is to get back to scientific facts. The second act we take is we rely on the international system, on the multilateral system that we have built. We do it uh, in Syria. So we, we simply rely on the OPCW, the FFM, and we used to rely on the gym. We don't try to influence. We don't try uh, to say that it's good or bad. We don't. Uh, commend the report uh, depending just on the uh, content of the report, we take it as is. Uh, because we believe that the impartiality, independence of those instruments is more important than that, uh, uh, that, that our judgment on the result. I mean, we, we trust this, these things. And we don't enter into uh, systematic criticism because we strongly believe that this is really, really critical that we maintain the independence and impartiality of these elements. And that's what you did in Salisbury by getting the OPCW support in. Uh, and uh, the report was uh, amazingly professional. That's what we see uh, in Syria. Uh, and once again, if you, go, if you just take one minute to read it, uh, 
and from time to time this is what people don't do uh, and 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 if you take the, the text uh, and look at the report and go through it you've got everything you need in it uh, it's just a professional scientific work uh, that establishes facts and don't try to uh, obfuscate things or hide uh, areas of uncertainty. So that's really the, the basis of any rational, basic. I mean, I, I come from a Cartesian country, right? So <laughs> uh, I, it's just the basis of what we do as professionals. We try to establish fact on the basis of a, a rational reasoning. And the last element is back to what Ilem said. We, we, we don't take inaction as an option. So we, so we take decisions. We took decisions to expel a number of uh, Russian uh, so-called diplomats. Uh, we took decisions on Syria, and we will continue to take decisions. So once again, we, what, what is important here uh, is that we act. Uh, and, and the title here, because at some point it's always good to be back to, <laughs> to the title and the subject <laughs> you gave us, is, is really about impunity mm -hmm. um, and accountability. And this is what we did. Thank you. Assistant Secretary Boulet, do you want to touch on this? Uh, only to just echo what, uh, what has been said and uh, to reinforce the point that, again, multilaterally as well uh, as on an individual basis, our support for the OPCW, uh, U.S. support bilaterally, uh, providing technical assistance, uh, providing that uh, capacity building uh, mechanism so that all countries who are state parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention could potentially someday be able to respond to an attack. Hopefully they won't need to, but should that be the case, be able to respond to an attack in the same professional, effective, and comprehensive manner that uh, the British government did uh, in responding to the attack on the Skripals. And I think the hope is also that convincing that uh, various countries have that ability would also be highly dissuasive of you. So it sort of fits into that system of, of restraint to sort of say, we're gonna deny the benefit. And, and deter the use you know, together. So I think that would be very helpful. In your report, uh, you mentioned, well, the, the authors mentioned, you being uh, one of the lead authors, uh, you mentioned the issue of deterrence. And in order for deterrence to work, there must be the certainty of a response. And that response has to be severe. Uh, in order to achieve that level of certainty and that level of severity, we do need to empower. Uh, we do need to provide the means, the, the technical means, the evidentiary record uh, for the countries to be able to reach that political decision-making uh, level. Absolutely. Okay, we have some time for some questions from all of you. Um, so if, uh, please raise your hand, there are microphones around the room. Do um, state your name and affiliation. And uh, right up here at the front, we'll start. Thanks, Rebecca. <clears throat> My name is Paul Walker with Green Cross International. Thank you all for a good discussion. Thank you to the DG as well for an excellent presentation. Glad to see you all here today. Um, there are many questions I'm sure we have, uh, but I want to pose a very straightforward one to, uh, to Ms. Job, our British representative, and that is, could you bring us up to date a bit on the investigation of Salisbury? I mean, what do we know right now, and have the Russians responded at all to the demolish that the British have, have put forward? Thank you. When we first uh, invited the Russian ambassador in to talk to us, we said, we've identified this nerve agent, we know Russia has developed this nerve agent. Would you like to explain? There must have been one of two options here. Either you used it, or you've lost control of your stock. Would you like to tell us which one it was? To my knowledge, they haven't replied to that question. <laughs> what we got instead was sort of rude messages out of the comms machine from the Russian embassy, and, and a general sort of disdain, which um, our Prime Minister referred to in, in, in Parliament, and if anything, just strengthened 
resolve. Um, in terms of the investigation itself, there's not much that I can share with you because that is being done through the proper investigative uh, channels. Um, there is, uh, as you know, there, well, let's put it this way, there is an absolute commitment in our system to get to the end of that investigation and to be able to say things publicly, as we did in the case of Litvinenko in London a few years ago. What we're not going to do is um, rush to judgment or yeah, sort of prejudice for all of the reasons that Nicola just referred to. We want it to be absolutely uh, crystal clear and focused. What I can say, if, just in case there's anyone who doesn't know, um, is that both the Skripals and the policemen affected, by the way, don't forget first responders in your sort of planning for this situation. Um, they are out of hospital, they are out of danger, um, and they are uh, coming to terms with what happened. Um, but in terms of the investigation, the precise details of what happened where, um, there is work ongoing, and I don't want to say anything publicly about that that might, uh, in case it were to cause any trouble. Thank you. Others? You are a quiet audience. Great. <laughs> Uh, Greg Koblenz from George Mason University. Um, as has already been discussed, uh, both Russia and Syria have uh, made extensive use of disinformation to uh, try and, and cover up and uh, deflect blame for the attacks in Syria and the UK. Aside from this, how, how this affects individual perceptions, have you seen any evidence that uh, Russia uh, or Syria have succeeded in muddying the waters enough with diplomats in New York or The Hague or in other governments uh, to provide space to other governments so that they don't have to take a stand? and they can sit on the sidelines. Uh, and if, if you see evidence of this, how do you think this is gonna play out in the special session coming up next week? If I could just mm -hmm. take that initially. Uh, just in recent weeks, obviously, the uh, Russian misinformation campaign, the, the bluster, which tends to be their go-to response, uh, has certainly intensified in New York. But uh, a readout that uh, we received from uh, our mission in New York, I believe that was uh, last week, uh, was actually a very positive one. It appeared that, again, the international community, responsible nations, have reached a critical turning point. That uh, despite Russia's efforts, or maybe because of Russia's uh, systematic efforts, they blatantly said to the Russians, enough, and uh, for the most part, they have rebuffed Russian attempts and are actually more committed than ever to supporting the uh, CSP, to finding any way, overcoming any logistical obstacle to make sure that they are present at the CSP and if possible at the highest level uh, that uh, their capabilities and that their government uh, will support. So. Once again, I believe we've reached a critical mass where these efforts have uh, been, are now becoming counterproductive to the Russian end goal uh, to cover up its own crimes as well as the crimes of others. If, if I may just add two points to that is, um, so, by the way, there is a semantic question here. We, we, in, in the French system, after long discussions, believe me, we've come to the point where we talk about information manipulation, not fake news, not anything else. We say that information is being manipulated. Uh, it's based on two elements, and I think the technical and factual analysis is extremely important here. What is, what is being done is a circulation of many different versions of facts. Um, so there is no interest in consistency. There is no interest in establishing alternative facts. The only objective here is to create the impression that we can't know the truth. So that's why Samantha was referring to that. We don't have one version of alternative facts that is repeated day and night uh, over an extended period of time. We have 15, 20, 25, 30 different versions of the facts. And, and each of these versions are contradictory between themselves. So you can have one official that says something in the morning and something completely opposite in the afternoon. That, that, that's not the point. The point is, and that's my second point, there is a strat strategy behind 
That, that doesn't happen by chance. Yeah. The strategy is precisely to make governments come to the conclusion that it's impossible to know the truth. And because of that impossibility, then it's better to stay away from the game. Um, so that, that's our, the, the two points. If we, we need really to be specific and precise in the way we analyze things and facts. And so the tactics that are being used and the strategy that is behind the tactics, those two elements are extremely important. The best instrument we have is exposure to public light. So what we do, and uh, this is what we did uh, around Syria, uh, we did the same around Salisbury, is we go to our partners in the international community and we explain our analysis. So we, ex we expose that. We say, this is what we believe happened. This, these are the facts. These are the uncertainties we have. This is the report that we, are, that we publish. And we expose this manipulation uh, the, of information campaign to public light. Uh, because that's the best instrument we have. If you, if you start entering into debunking the, uh, uh, the, 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 the alternative fact, then you're lost. Uh, but this is very powerful when you get to a government, to a partner, to our friends and partners in the world, and we, and we explain that. Uh, then, then when you have two versions of the same uh, event that are completely contradictory between the morning and the afternoon, it speaks for itself. And I would add one extra um, level, which is the importance of that uh, neutral professional expert conclusion. Uh, it's incredibly powerful when it comes from an expert body which has a, a reputation for exactly that neutrality, professional, uh, professionalism, expertise. So for us, it's another reason to be strengthening um, the analytical capability and the attribution capability of the OPCW. Because then it's not part of a, oh, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? And they would say that, wouldn't you? It's the, it's the body which we have imbued with that responsibility. Excellent. Take one more question here. Actually, Samantha, I think you hit on part of what I was about to ask you is, again, it's a lesson learned. We've seen and talked about five, six, seven incidents, and we've talked about briefly, broadly, our ability to respond to them, our ability to go in and detect, take a sample, protect, uh, mitigate, uh, decontaminate, restore areas, uh, analytical laboratories from potentially disinterested parties or other state parties. How well are we as a community documenting uh, how well we did respond and identifying those capability gaps where we didn't quite have a response readily available and we had to go to maybe one state party that had the unique capability that we now, if we can't restrain, we need to start preparing for the next incident. Because I don't think any of us would say that this is not going to happen in some form again. So how well are we preparing ourselves for that next response? Uh, I think there is a, uh, in all of our governments, there is a culture of kind of reflection and learning and, you know, with the, it goes through the territory. Uh, but I think if you look at the international level, it, it brings us right back to where we started. So with Nicola describing um, how we can share information through the Impunity Initiative, how we actually have these conversations and not sort of sit in a corner pretending it didn't happen or pretending it was perfect or whatever, but just being much more ready to have those conversations. And I think it comes back to what we've all been saying about strengthening the OPCW and the, and the technical capabilities there and the political space for them to operate and do all of those things. Um, there is uh, you know, equal... Um, I can't quite put it, but if you're, we're all extremely, um, have an extremely strong response to the Syrian use, but we also have a strong response to obfuscation, not allowing inspectors to have a look, um, you know, just not letting the process of assessing what happened, that kind of stuff is, is just as much the bad behavior um, because it undermines that overall uh, conclude because they can see where that's going to go. Um, so we need to empower that level of the technical support as well, in the field, as you say, and giving them room to maneuver and room to do the jobs that they need to do for all of us. Anyone else? Preparedness? Since it's presumably the last question you mentioned, I just wanted to highlight, uh, it's in some ways a tangential point, but it really goes to the support of the work that the OPCW does. And, and that is, there are efforts uh, by some who understand the criticality 
of the OPCW to the United States, to all the state parties, but in particular those countries represented here and, and other key allies and partners. Uh, and as a result, seek to use uh, the OPCW for their unilateral political gain. Uh, it is not an effort that advances the work of the OPCW. It is not an effort that advances the global norm against CW use. And uh, I would just like to underscore uh, to all of us uh, who are gathered here today that uh, applying pressure on those entities that are not nation states uh, but who seek to use whether it's the OPCW or other uh, similar technical vital organizations to achieve their very narrow political uh, objectives uh, is also a threat to the work of the OPCW to the international norm against the use of CW uh, and could have far-reaching ramifications beyond the OPCW. So hopefully we will keep that in mind and work together to prevent the use of uh, OPCW and other such uh, technical and critical international uh, organizations uh, to try to dispel their use as a, a political weapon to achieve, again, very narrow political goals. If I may, just two, two small points. What, one is a half a joke, uh, but a number of, of you spoke about the impunity initiative. If we can say that this is the no impunity <laughs> <laughs> partnership, I think that would, <laughs> that would be good. Because actually we are trying to uh, um, prevent impunity, not, not create impunity. Um, the, sec the second remark is way more serious. Um, uh, as, as always, uh, the OPCW Director General chooses uh, his words very carefully. And there is one sentence in, in the speech that he gave that, that uh, was very short uh, but uh, critical. Um, I think uh, he said uh, that we are at a crossroads. Uh, and I think this is exactly the right summary of what we have been talking about this morning. Um, and uh, that crossroads is really about whether we can gather political will to strengthen a non-pro-chemical weapons regime that is under threat. And that's exactly what is at stake next week. Can we come together to re-strengthen uh, a regime that has served our security well uh, for the last decades, uh, but that is under threat. Well, thank you very much. You know, I, I, I think I speak both for myself, but people I know in the audience who've been committed to this, these issues, in fact, for many years. And, you know, I think for most of us, the most what we want and the reason why we work on these issues is because we actually want to work on something that matters. We want to work on something that makes a difference, that at the end of the day makes people safer, protects our nation, um, does good in the world, right? That's why we're here. And what I think is fascinating and why we are putting our faith in you and you with so much on your plates um, and with important weeks like next week and the week beyond um, to, to work on this problem, it's because it actually really matters that this is work that matters. And I think you've brought that out in the discussion and in the Director General's remarks. You're actually going to work that speaks to the foundation of the global rules-based system. You're speaking to work that is about the protection of truth. Incredibly important. And I think thirdly, you're speaking to work that is about justice for real victims real victims in real places with mothers and fathers and children who've been hurt irrevocably by the use of these weapons. And it is upon us collectively to seek justice for that. And I think the system is there, but it's incredibly hard work, um, but it's work that matters. So thank you so much to all of you for doing that work and for being committed to these issues. And thank you for making your time available. I know you're all busy um, and to engage on this important topic. So with that, please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you. Thank you.